Well, good morning, friends. Glad you're here this morning. Would you stand and listen to these words from Psalm 148? It says, Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all deeps, fire and hail, snow and mist, stormy wind fulfilling his word, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all livestock, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and maidens together, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above earth and heaven. Let's join with creation and praise our great God. Reaches of heaven, starry height, lights of the evening, dancing in silent skies, brilliance of morning, breaking day, oh, let them praise Him, praise His name. Sing, oh, praise. Oh, praise His name. Oh, praise His name. Let all His wondrous works declare His praise. Mightiest mountains, peaceful plains, snowfall and fire, thundering Ocean waves, kings and their kingdoms, age to age. Oh, let them praise Him, praise His name. Sing, oh, praise His name. Oh, praise His name. Oh, praise His name. Let all His wondrous works declare His praise. Oh, praise His name. Oh, praise His name. Let all His wondrous works declare His in majesty all things made by his decree hear creation's melody praise him praise him everything with life and breath everywhere from east to west every heart raised from the dead praise him Praise Him, angels echo the refrain, Jesus, Lamb for sinners slain, name above all other names. Praise Him, oh, praise His name, oh, praise His name, let all His wondrous works your voices, oh praise. Oh, praise His name. Oh, praise His name. Let all His wondrous works declare His praise. Oh, praise His name. Oh, praise His name. Let all his wondrous works declare his praise. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, Lord.
Lord, we praise your name. We uh, feel it in our hearts. And Lord, we come before you uh, as broken people that need a Savior. And Lord, we just praise your name for saving us. There is no other option. There's no other place we can run but you, Lord Jesus. And so, Lord, we praise you that you're available, that, Lord, you're receiving still sinners into your glory, that the gates of heaven are still open, and, Lord, that your arms are calling us to yourself. And so, Lord, would you uh, open our hearts today, and would you encourage us, though it seems scary, though it seems like we would be punished, but that we would flee to you in faith that you love us and care for us. And Lord, we pray for the sick ones that are having difficulty, John Canogenhelm and Jean Stewart and Ruthie French and several others. I pray that you just bless them. Thank you for the surgeries and things that went well this week. I just praise your name for those things. Now, Lord, go before us. Help us to have attentive ears. Would you, Lord, take distractions out of our hearts and minds that we would open your word and that you would touch us through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Lord bless you. Thank you for being here. Welcome. I'm Pastor Mark, the pastor of Grant Hills Baptist Church. It's a great privilege to be the pastor here. And um, it's great to see you here, church family and visitors. Um, in your bulletin, we have the senior luncheon tomorrow morning, um, 11.30. It's a joyful time. Uh, pastor Allen, uh, our pastor here, will be preaching that. And then we have the annual chili cook-off coming Friday. So bring it. Bring your game. All right? We'll see who wins that. I've never won it. So I'm trying. But uh, anyway, uh, um, we'll go ahead. We have, I have youth trying. I've had a youth beat me once. That was hard, but uh, uh, it's a great fun. Bring a game. We'll have a game night, and so it's for the whole family. Hey, prepare your heart. Lord's Supper's coming next Sunday night, and so as you go through this week, would you say, how am I, Lord, with you? I'm about to partake in a memorial service and well, all that you've done. Um, how am I? And so uh, uh, I'll read a piece of scripture that might encourage you there. Lastly, we have men's outing coming up. You need to sign up, it's, and it's in the back here. We're going to Wall Canyon Reservoir. It's a fun place to go. It's generally a good fishing hole. Um, it's a great thing to bring your quad or your four-wheel drive, and we just have a good time. We have a little Bible study, and we just hang out and uh, enjoy each other's company in the Lord. And so uh, that's coming up here in end of May. But listen to these words. Um, I have to read this every once in a while just to encourage my heart. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return to the Lord. And what will he do? What will God do? It says here, and he will have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon you. Isn't that good news? For a weary heart, maybe you have one today. Lord bless you. Would you stand to your feet? Let's sing to the Lord. Let's run to him. There's a place where mercy reigns and never There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide, where all the love I've ever found comes like a flood, comes flowing At the cross, at the cross, 
I surrender my life. I'm in awe of you. I'm in awe of you. Where your love ran red and my sin washed white, I owe all to you. I owe all to you, Jesus. There's a place where sin and shame are powerless. Where my heart has peace with God and forgiveness. flood comes flowing down. Sing at the cross. At the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life. I'm in awe of you. I'm in awe of you. Where your love ran red and my sin washed white, I owe all to you. Sing, hear my hope. Here my hope is found, here on holy ground. Here I bow down, here I bow down. Here arms open wide, here you saved my life. Here I bow down, here I bow down. At the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life. I'm in awe of you. I'm in awe of you. Where your love ran red and my sin washed white, I owe all to you. I owe all to you. Sing at the cross. At the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life. I'm in awe of you. I'm in awe of you. Where your love ran red and my sin washed white, I owe all to you. 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 thank you for today, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity to be in your house this morning, Lord, where we can come and, and praise you, Lord, and, and worship in your name, Lord. We just thank you for, for all these people and all of my brothers and sisters being here this morning, Lord. And Lord, I just pray that you would bless this offering as we give back just a portion of what you have given, given to us and use it for your glory and your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.
invite you to stand as we sing about the scene that unfolds in Revelation 5, as we sing Revelation song. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, holy, holy is He. Sing a new song to Him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Let's sing that again, worthy. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, holy, holy is He. Sing a new song to Him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Sing holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Clothes in rainbows of living color, flashes of lightning, rolls of thunder. Sing it out. Blessing and honor, strength and glory and power be to you, the only wise King. Sing, He's holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. of your name. Sing his name. Jesus, your name is power, breath and living water, such a marvelous mystery. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything and I will adore you. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you.
when the enemy surrounds and my heart grows faint within when the darkness overwhelms and my fears are pressing in i will trust in you O lord in the silence i will wait i will stand upon your word you're my solid rock and my salvation my steadfast hope that won't be shaken my soul will wait my soul will wait for you you're my stronghold and my shield in the midst of every threat though the wicked never yield they will vanish like a breath Yes, I know the outcome sure. Satan's evil plans will fail. In your power I'm secure. You're my solid rock and my salvation. My steadfast hope that won't be shaken. My soul will wait. My soul will wait for you. You're my comfort when I feel forsaken, my refuge and my sure foundation. My soul will wait, my soul will wait for you. This is love I can't explain. This is mercy unreserved through your sacrifice so great. I have peace that's undeserved For the battle has been won And I fear no shame or loss Now the sting of death is gone Sing it out! You're my solid rock And my salvation My steadfast hope That won't be shaken My soul will wait my soul will wait for you. You're my comfort. You're my comfort when I feel forsaken. My refuge and my sure foundation. My soul will wait. My soul will wait for you. your voice is pouring. Pouring out our hearts before you, we will trust in you. Perfect Savior, strong defender, we will trust in you. Father, we thank you that we can pour our hearts out to you, that you, while sustaining life and breath and everything that we just called to praise you, you incline your ear to hear our prayers. Father, that should amaze and overwhelm us in the best way. That you, the living God, the King of the universe, to whom all blessing and honor and glory and power are due, would listen to redeem sinners, pour out their hearts, pour out our anxieties before you, and lay them at your feet, knowing that you can bear them better than we. Lord, we are weak, we are 
stumbling under the burdens of another week. We come to you with pain. We come to you with grief. We come to you with confusion and bewilderment. We come to you with joy and elation. We come to you from all different places, from all different circumstances, and you know each of them better than we do. And we thank you for that. We thank you that we have a God who knows our situation even better than we think we do. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he is the lamb for sinners slain, that he has risen from the grave and now he is reigning at your right hand, Father, and he has given us your Holy Spirit to give us that peace that just doesn't make sense in light of our circumstances. Father, I pray that that peace that transcends understanding would overwhelm us, would override and quell the anxiety in our hearts, would, would override the distractions that busy our minds, would settle our spirits right now. Father, make our hearts tender and pliable, malleable to your word. Lord, would you shape and mold us through your word preached? Father, I pray that as we encounter Genesis 3, as Pastor Mark preaches, that you would open our eyes and ears to see and hear what you have for us to learn, convict us of sin, encourage us where we are downcast and need our heads lifted up. Lord, I pray that you would... Um, answer these prayers that we just poured out to you. When, when Satan's schemes are prevailing, when the enemy seems to be overwhelming us, that, that we can come to you. And Lord, show us how you came to Adam and Eve as, as they were tricked by the serpent. Show us how to guard our own hearts and our families from his schemes, from his devices. Thank you for the gospel that crushes the serpent and overcomes our weakness and our sin. I pray that the gospel would be held high this hour. In Jesus' name and for his glory we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you, team. Appreciate that. Well, we're, we're in our second uh, sermon of uh, lessons in Genesis, family lessons in Genesis. I uh, really want to focus on the family. And um, <clears throat> last week, uh, Pastor Mike really talks us about what a family is. What is a family? A husband, a wife, um, male, female. We, we got all into that. <clears throat> and that's, uh, it was really good. It's a great segue into Genesis 3. And I want you to turn there. And the title of the sermon is pretty bold. Um, <clears throat> it might challenge you on how bold it is. Um, it's, it, the, the title of the sermon is The Family's Biggest Decision. Your family's biggest decision that you'll ever make. Uh, you'll probably say, well, Pastor Mark, you uh, probably don't know the ins and outs of my family. And I would say, you're right, I don't. Um, but I, I challenge you today that I believe I have your biggest decision you'll ever make. And some would say, well, I think the biggest decision you'll ever make is to come to faith in Christ. And I would say, yes, but you're going to have to make this decision before you do it. This big decision. Before you can come to Christ, even. A family must make uh, large and critical decisions. Uh, I've done those. Uh, and I still am doing those. One of the first decisions you will make to marry. Uh, I suggest a list of game changers. All right? Uh, I, I had one in my head, just about four or five things. that I said, that's it, you know? Um, Hope had a list of 20. Uh, some of us have a list of 40, and the older we get, the shorter it gets. But that's a pretty big decision. You only get one chance to pick one of your family members. The rest is up to God, all right? So uh, that's big. Uh, and I, these game changers mean that uh, you would not even uh, date someone without these qualities. You wouldn't even date them if they didn't have these qualities. You wouldn't date them. You'll, uh, you'll make health decisions. Uh, just what kind of healthy things you're going to do in your life. Uh, locations to live decisions. You know, where on this planet are we going to live? Career decisions. What, what I think the Lord wants me to do. Uh, financial decisions. Number one, cause for divorce today. Finances. Uh, educational decisions, you know, how much money am I going to spend on my education? How hard am I going to work at it? 
uh, how important is it going to be to me? Discipline of children decisions. A pretty good conflict on almost every marriage at some point is what are we going to do with these kids when they disobey? Uh, child care decisions. That's a really big one in our culture today. Oh, and here's a big one. What church will we agree to, as a family to attend? Will it come down to uh, the music played at the church or, or, or the size of the youth group or the age of the preacher or if you were greeted uh, by everyone with a smile before you sat down? Uh, I mean, those are important, but just what is the biggest decision you and your family will ever make? And it's involved in those, but it's not those. I remember it quite well. It was a warm summer evening working Central District. I was a patrolman. When I saw a car at Fifth and Arlington uh, driving erratically, something was wrong. I pulled it over. A lone occupant, a 20-year-old female lady. Uh, this is back in the really heavy meth days. We call them coke bugs. Uh, you take so much meth that the, your nervous system begins to fry at the ends on your skin, and you scratch until you get a, a scab, and this lady had them all over her arms. And she was tweaking, is what we say. And I got her out of the car, and I was talking to her. She's still in her pajamas. It's uh, all nine at night. And I ask her for her identification, and she gives it to me. And it's an extremely prominent name of a family in Reno, Nevada. And I look at that and look at her and go, any relation? You know? If I said the name, half of you would know them. And she goes, yeah, that's my dad. And through the veneer of meth use and everything, I see a, a really pretty young girl is what I see. And I said, uh, what's going on here? You're, you're driving this beat-up truck, and you're definitely in, in active use. What happened to you? Can you tell me? She goes, I can tell you the day. I said, I'm all ears, man. I had time. And uh, in front of that little pickup truck, she said, I was a straight A student. I was a junior in high school. I was going to Re Reno High. I had the world by the tail, Officer Morton. And uh, I had a scholarship getting lined up. Of course, we didn't need it. My family's got all sorts of money. And um, I went to a party. Drank a little bit. So there's one hurdle she jumped over and didn't worry about drinking. And she said, uh, uh, a friend of mine, quote, unquote, friend, came up and said, hey, try this. Just try some of this. It'll make you feel great. Now, she's had all the warnings about this. She, she, she's been told by her parents, this will happen one day. I told all of my kids, I know you'll probably go someplace where uh, I told you to never go, but when you're there, you're going to be offered something. And that day will be either the beginning of the worst day of your life, and you'll look back to it as I wish I could take it back, which this girl did. She said, I took the meth, it hit me, and I was hooked. And I haven't stopped since, and I'm 20 years old, Officer Morton. She goes, I wish I could go back. I had everything. She was the, 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 uh, the leader of the cheerleading group in Reno High. She was a beautiful lady. And she wished she could go back. To that one day where she made a decision and uh, and I want to say this it turned out the, that this biggest decision of her life could be pinpointed to the very moment an offer was made to her and a decision had to be made you see the biggest decision was not taking drugs or not 
It seems like it. That, that seems normal. But really, that's not the big decision for her. The big decision is whether she's going to believe the truth about drugs that she already knew. She already knew all that. But am I going to believe that? All my parents have told me everything I've read, every, every counselor that's ever told me anything. She instead put away the clear truth of what she knew and said, it won't happen to me. I'm different than other people. I arrested her for everything I could that day. I wanted her to feel as much weight of that decision to get her away from it as I could. We, me and you, probably often look back to the biggest decision we've ever made, and often it's from the worst decision we've ever made. You might have one of those in your life. We call that regret. We wish we could go back and have that decision over again with what we know now, but life doesn't work like that. We live and die with our decisions. And I am proposing this to you today, that the biggest decision you will ever make for yourself and for your family is are you going to trust the Word of God? Are you going to take it and say, that's the truth? Or not? Is there somebody or someone that can persuade you away from the Word of God that, by the way, heaven and earth will pass away, but not this? And are you going to do that? Many church people say yes to that. But what they mean is, as long as it does not cross what I think's right, or what I really want, or if it's culturally relative, as long as it does not tell me how I, I'm going to spend my money, I'm fine. As long as it doesn't tell me what I'm going to do with my time, I'm good, I'll, I'll obey it. Um, or my secret little darling sin that doesn't seem to hurt anyone, right? I, as long as I can have that and the gospel and Jesus and the Bible, and as long as I can rip out just a couple pages, I'll, I, I'm agreeing with that. That's really the church issue today all across America and the world. The scripture we're about to read is very similar to this young girl I pulled over. I can't tell you her name, but I can tell you this girl's name. Her name was Eve. And she got pulled over by the devil. And it's about a, a woman and her husband that knew the truth, that knew the clear word of God, but did it anyway. And it will turn out to be the day they wish they could take back because they have lost in one moment everything that they knew was peace. So would you stand with me as we reread extremely familiar scripture for many of us. I'll probably read to verse 8. Uh, Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from the tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it, or you will die. And the serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from it its fruit and ate. And she gave it to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden, in the cool of the day, 
And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? Lord, um, we've all been here. We've all been tempted. We've all have actually failed here. Would you open our hearts? Would you help us, Lord? We make so many decisions all the time, but if we went back to this one, it would solve so many decisions in our life. Lord, would you fill our hearts today with your gospel? In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I am... Um, I, we, we can talk about so many things. There's, there's 10 sermons in these scriptures here, but I want to focus on this decision. And I, wanna, I just want to answer this question, why? Why is this the biggest decision? Why is trusting the Word of God, believing it, living it, making your book of your life the biggest decision your family will ever make? And so I just want to get to that. All right. There are so many other angles to go from on this, but let's just talk. Why is this the biggest decision? I'm going to give you five things, and I'm going to try to go as fast as I can in about 20 minutes. And so let's, let's hit with it. Right now, number one, it's right off the top. It's verse one because of this decision, because the craftiness of your enemy. Because... The craftiness of your enemy is one of the reasons you for sure need to have this book in your heart. Verse 1 states plainly that we are not alone in decision making. That Eve was not by herself and she knew it. That with every temptation there's a tempter. And, and this entity is said to have a quality about him that is listed first in all of the scripture about Satan. Satan's a lot of things. I mean, he's a deceiver. He's, he's your adversary. He's all this. But it says here, the first thing that God ever said about Satan was he's crafty. Meaning in the Hebrew that he's, and, and by the, 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 the King James say cunning. He's cunning or tricky with the focus of evil treachery, with a focus of evil treachery. You might have a buddy, you might have somebody, I have a couple in my life, they like to do tricks on me, they like to scare me, they like to do things like that, and, and that, it's kind of funny, um, and some of it's kind of funny, I even watch them on TikTok, it's pretty funny, but this guy's not funny like that. It says the serpent was more cunning and treacherous than any other creation on the earth. There's no one like this. And the reason that your biggest decision you will ever make is to believe the, 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 and obey the Bible is because you have a real enemy and he's crafty and he will tell you half-truths and, and use even the word of God to trick you. Now, what kind of trick is he trying to trick you with? Scare you? Startle you? Ruin your day? No, he's much more devious than that. He wants to kill you. He wants to steal your relationships with God, and he wants to destroy your good life. In fact, he has come to kill, steal, and destroy. How do I know that? The Bible told me. And I've experienced it. He hates me. He hates you so much. Why? Why does he hate you? This is a, a, a deciding moment in your life you have to answer. Why does devil hate me? In chapter 2, God made you an image bearer. You have a stamp on you spiritually. You are an image bearer of your creator God. You represent Jesus on this earth. And he hates you for it. You see, Jesus is taking him down. And he hates anything that looks like anything like Jesus. That's why he hates your marriage. It's a picture of God and Jesus. 
That's why he hates a lot of things. Um, and he hates you because you're an image bearer. And the devil wants to destroy the image of God everywhere he can find it. And he wants to mar it. And the best, best way to do it is for you to believe him instead of the word of God. And after that, you will walk through this world believing a lie about God and about yourself. You will believe something else. And boy, is that going on in our culture today. In the end, it will end in the destruction of your soul and bring you the greatest grief for you and your family in this life and the life to come. It'll be the worst decision you ever make to step away from this. Without the Word of God, you don't, under, you, you don't, you don't stand a chance. This crafty enemy, you must have a grip on the promises of God and know for sure that heaven and earth will pass away, but the word of the Lord will stand forever. And so this is coming into our culture by marring our God-given image and refusing to believe the Bible about who you are in Christ. Instead, the devil has convinced people that how God made you was wrong that he's made a mistake, or there is no God, and you're just an, a, a work of evolution, and so God made you a woman, now you want to be a man. And you take incredible recourses, because you believe this, to mar your body. It's going on all the time. Because he hates you, and he wants you to mar your image. And God made you to represent him, not yourself. But now you represent you on earth, and it's all about you and what you want. And God made you to love him and yourself, but now the devil has convinced you to cut yourself, to mar yourself, all of which I just talked about, I've talked to somebody about in the last month all of them women. But it, it goes to us guys too. We have to believe this because if we don't know our enemy, we will not know how to fight. He's crafty. He wants to kill still and destroy your life. So that's number one. It's right here. And he slithers away and blows it for our first family. And he's still doing it today. He's sneaking into your home. He's convincing you of something that's not true. And you start living it. And he's destroying your life. And he's done it to me. And he's done it to you. Number two. The number two thing you want this Bible, you, you, you have to trust this Bible because you cannot trust your eyes all the time. We're faulty. The Bible says we're to live by faith, not by sight, because sight gets us in trouble many times. There comes a time, and it's more often than we think, that when making a decision about life and family, that often uh, the wrong not only may look like the right thing, but also the best thing right now. It just seems like it's the best thing right now. What an opportunity! And the devil will make it. He'll give you a good thing so you don't pick the best thing. It'll seem right because we're walking through this world with our eyes and not our faith in the Word of God. It has, the Word of God has saved me from so many eye candies, I can't tell you. All right? And so it's a command that we are to live by faith, not by sight. And so Eve looked at the tree under the influence of Satan's lie and, and the light of her eyes and what she thought instead of the Word of God. The Word of God says, don't do it. She knew it. She says, I shouldn't even touch it. I, I shouldn't go near it. And the devil has lied to her openly. You surely will not die. Did you read that? And then he went on saying, you know, God's trying to keep something from you. God doesn't have your best. He's trying to keep all the goods to himself. He doesn't want you to be like him. You see, God does know sin, but not like we do. We know it through experience. 
He knows it through holiness, and he's angry with it all day long. And so we see that, that it's, it, it's, it was good for food, she said, that it was a delight to the eyes. She's looking from the influence of Satan, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise. I could be smart. And all of these things are directly uh, away from the Word of God and living by sight, not by faith. In fact, we're, these are listed in 1 John 2, 16, right? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. All that's just wrapped up right here with Eve. The big three, right? And so the reason this is the biggest decision you'll ever make in your family is to trust and obey God's word is because your fleshly eyes will often want something you should not have. Or you shouldn't have it right now. And this is why we need the word of God always before us because it's not just a book or some letters in a certain order. It's the living and active Word of God, sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of the soul and the spirit, and both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of your heart. That's what the Word of God, it can cut through you and actually open up your heart, and what's it go after? Motives and intentions. Boy, that was, that's, that's a great thing to have in your heart. Even committing crimes, destruction of property, someone to, to be arrested for destruction of property, you have to show intent. So the kid that hits the baseball and goes, oops, I hit the wrong way, and hits your window is not a destruction of property. You might think it feels like it when it goes to the window of your house, like I did to our neighbor. And... He was going to call the police, and the police called him and said, it's not a crime. He didn't do it on purpose. It's a civil problem. He needed an attorney. No, he just needed my dad. My dad worked it out. But you see, we have, what, what's, what's your intent? What's your motive in this life? Is it to obey God and his word, or do you have some other diabolical idea? And so the word of God is what we need because we can be easily fooled not just by the enemy of the truth, but by our own thoughts, intentions of our hearts. And the Word of God is able to judge these things. Instead of us judging our own thoughts and feelings, we turn to the Word of God. And, and judging our own thoughts and feelings outside the Word of God is, well, the first step of making the biggest decision mistake you've ever had in your life. How about Lot? Pick where you want to live. Lot, we're going to get into this. Uh, later on in this series. Lot, of, and he looked down and saw that Jordan Valley with all that nice grass and all that money he could make. What he didn't think about is who lived there. He was thinking about something that he thought would make him happy. It would be the ruin of his life because he was looking with his eyes instead of faith. How about King David? I have a sermon I'm working on. It's called Rooftop Decisions. We all have had them. The biggest day of his life was on a rooftop at the pinnacle of his, of, of his, of his kingdom. At the greatest moment, he was my age, right here, roughly. And he made a decision that would change his whole trajectory of his, of his kingdom and his family. When our emotions, feelings of God, get, given needs, give, I mean present needs, you have some needs. I know you have some needs. For women, it's, it's different than men. We, we all want sincere praise from one another. But, but your wife, she needs some intimate communication. She wants you to share your heart with her. And she wants some security. She wants to know when you walk out to go to work, you're her man. The man, he wants, some, he wants some sincere praise, but he wants some sexual fulfillment. It's part of his makeup. It's, it's how God made us. He also wants some significance, that you need him. It's interesting how we think as men and women. 
a man goes and gets a job so he can have dependence, so people can depend on him. The feminist goes and gets a job so she can be free and independent. Not, not, not every woman, the feminist. That's their, that's their thing. We're different. We have needs, and God knows these needs, and we try to go fulfill them outside of the Word of God. So, the first, you have a crafty enemy. Second, you can't trust your eyes all the time. You'll be fooled. Hey, thirdly, because the Lord wants you to live. The Lord wants good for you. He wants you to live. The reason that the Lord has preserved His Word was so that you could have the life He has created you for. A life of joy and purpose without regret and a bunch of depression. The Word of God is seen as a guide, a, a lamp into my feet and a light into my path. Right here, right now, today, not in the future, right here. Without it, we walk in darkness. Without it, we walk through, through this world without the light of Jesus Christ and we get lost without the Word of God. And God's want you to have a great life and He's not trying to keep you from this what's good He's not being a killjoy. God wants you to have a great life. He's not trying to keep you from this stuff. His commands are, are very good. They're clean, the Bible says, to help you walk in the way of right relationship with our Creator. At 15 years old, I had a profound encounter with my parents. I was at a breakfast. My dad had gone to work. And my brother and I were just discussing about a girl who became pregnant in our school. It was new to us. We'd never seen anything like it. We're in a small community. And I was just sitting there pondering it. And my mom was handing me a plate of pancakes when I said, Mom, what would Dad do if I got a girl pregnant? I was like, he'd kill me, you know. And she's handing me the pancakes and went, Why? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, no, 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 nothing like that going on, Mom. And she was about to hand me the pancakes, and my mom has some God moments in my life where she said the perfect thing. I thought she would say, we would kill you, <laughs> you know, over the top. And before she handed the pancakes, she looked at me and said, that would hurt your dad so bad. That's not what I expected. I went, I can hurt dad. Oh, son. And, and at 15, I found out in my heart that my parents wanted the best for me. Do you know how many kids never get there? They, I always had suspicion that my parents were trying to keep something from me. They're trying to keep me from having a good time. And at that moment, I went, they love me more than I know. And they want the best for me. It changed our relationship. I began to go, I'm going to obey them. I'm going to start listening to them. This must happen with the Lord in you. You must know. He's not trying to keep you from something. He's trying to save your life. He has a life for you that's good. And you're blowing it. Because you want your way. And you don't know that right before you is the best news you'll ever get. I... I was sitting with a 24-year-old kid this last week. He came to Christ miraculously a year ago. He's 24 and finishing his master's. And he said, I, I think I want to be a police officer. I went, wow. Well, you'll be the chief. Because <laughs> not too many of us do what you're about to do because he's been offered a doctorate at UNR right here. He said, how do you make it? How do you make it through law enforcement? How do you make it through this life? All he's been is a professional student all his life. He hasn't had any outside, outside experience. 
I said, okay, here, stop. Okay, I just want to stop you right now, and I'm going to ask you, church, the same thing. They're the big three. I looked at this man and said, John, there are three, anger, lust, and greed. Which one do you fall to? Which one do you struggle with? Don't play around with me, John. Tell me what it is. I tell that, I ask men that over half say lust. It's a common thing. Some say greed. Some say anger. Anger's a big one, too. Now, what are you going to do with that weakness? Because if you don't get a handle on it, it'll handle you. If you don't put barriers up, if you don't say, hey, this is, this is my problem. See, we're, we're born in sin, and we're going to fall one way or the other, and, and we're going to do that. Man, women, doesn't matter who you are. I said, that's how you do it. You fight, and you get in the Word of God, and you get real about your weaknesses. Or you're going to be taken out because the devil's going to walk you down a road that will take your life. I must go on, and I'm over time. Number four, so that you know how to rightfully cover your shame. You need the word of God because you are going to blow it. You're going to make bad decisions in your family. I have, you have. I thought they were good. It turned out not to be good. I thought I had a handle on something. I thought, and I was living by sight when I should have lived by faith. And just, I didn't do it. So what do you do? What do you do when you've blown it? What do you do when you know you've failed, you've gone against the word of God? Well, here it says that they ran off and covered themselves with fig leaves. I don't know how ridiculous that must have looked. Art, artists have tried. They probably didn't get it very good. And they went on a hiding mission. They hid from God. Um, it is something that is going on right now. It is, a lot of people don't come to church. It's too much. They, they're, they're, they're hiding from God, and they, they, they come to a church, or they come to the church that never talks about it, so they feel comfortable. But you see, when you're hiding and you're doing a cover-up job, it just shows how much more treachery you have in your life. I've been to many crime scenes where someone tried to cover it up, and all it did was show more guilt in their life. And the Bible says, he who conceals his sin will not prosper. But he who, what, confesses and forsakes it will have mercy. You can't cover your sin. So what do you do? Well, it says in verse 21, go to 21, and um, it says, And the Lord God made garments of skin from a for Adam and his wife and clothed them. He went and killed some animals. I think it was a lamb. Me personally, it would have been the nicest place, nicest stuff to have on your body. And I don't know what kind of, there's an old, old, before the King James Bible came out, they had the Breeches Bible. It was out of England, and they called it the Breeches Bible because right here at 21, it says, and God made britches for him. So whatever that meant in English, britches. But he made these things. He covered them because something had to die. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. Only God can cover you. You cannot cover your own sins. If you cover your own sins and do a cover-up job and hide away, it'll curse you. The only thing Jesus cursed on this earth was a fig tree for this reason. Don't you try covering your sins. I must go. Number five. Here's the number one, number five reason. It might be the number one reason why you need to obey the word of God. In the end, you will have a meeting with God. I'm, I'm telling you right now. I don't care if you don't believe in him. You're going to have a meeting with him. Face to face with Christ our Savior. Face to face. What will it be? We sing that all the time. You're going to have, hey, Adam and Eve didn't get, they could run, but they couldn't hide. Jesus didn't, God didn't ask them, hey, where are you? Like he didn't know. It was a question for them. 
And so I have to ask it to you. Where are you? Mom, Dad, have you made poor decisions and thought you could do something outside of the Word of God? And now you regret it? And it appears you, you, you can't go back. Hey, you can confess it, and you can change right now in midstream. Even if your kids are out of the home, you can, you can tell them, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. Hey, I want to do things differently. Maybe, Mom and Dad, you need to just go home today. I don't care how old you are. I don't care if you're elderly or you're just brand new. you got a bunch of kids or you're about to get married. And maybe you should get with your spouse or your fiancé and say, hey, let's make a commitment. Hope and I did this. We're going to live by this even when it's uncomfortable. And trust me, you, it's going to get uncomfortable. In this broken world, you have to have a commitment like that. Would you bow your heads? Thank you for your attentiveness and letting me go over nine minutes. But uh, as your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed, no one looking around. If you're here today and you are not following the word of God, you have not made a commitment to Jesus, you're going to walk out of here if you do, lost. And you know the Lord is opening your heart to maybe the sin in your life that you're regretting. If you have regret, that's a powerful thing that the Lord can use to help you. But if you're here today with just me looking around, say, Pastor, would you pray for me? That's me. I, 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 I got to come out of hiding. I'm, I'm doing a cover-up. I'll pray for you. Anybody else? I've already prayed for you. Anybody else? Yeah. I'll pray for you. Hey, uh, I felt the same way. I was in a service like this, and I just asked Jesus to save me that I agree with his word and I was going to live by it. I haven't done it perfectly, but boy, has he blessed me for following him. And he's been so gracious to me and my wife and my children. Lord, would you bless this invitation? Lord, would you give courage to those that need to walk this aisle? Some of them are Christians, some of them aren't. To just say, hey, I, I, we've stepped away from the word of God and I have to make a decision today to save my family. Oh, Lord, would you give them courage to do such a thing? If they need to walk this aisle to do it, Lord, I'd pray with them. I'm their pastor. Lord, whatever decision they have to join the church or to, to get baptized or any other decision, Lord, uh, repentance, I pray that you would bless this invitation. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand to your feet? You come as the Lord leads you. We'll wait for you. Breakfast. <laughs> Come, O oh sinner, come and see Christ the Lord upon a tree. See the crown of thorns adorn the King who labors to breathe in agony. Come, O oh sinner, come and see what our God became to set us free. Come, O oh sinner, come and mourn, for he calls your sin his own. Do you feel the weight of justice, sir? He suffers the wrath that you deserve. Come, O oh sinner, come and mourn, for he bears the curse for all you've done. Oh, the of this awesome scene where our Savior bleeds all oh, the power of the love of God come and stand in
Thank you very much. Uh, this invitation is always open. You can grab me after service. Uh, may the Lord bless you. Um, and uh, I want you to talk to your spouse about this subject today. Over, di over dinner, just real quick, say, hey, wh where are we at on that? Are we going to obey the Word of God or not? Is there something in our life that's out of focus here? I would, I'd encourage you to do that. I'm going to do that with my wife today. All right? Lord bless you. Pastor Mike, would you pray us uh, into uh, the next? Father, thank you for providing a way to cover our shame and our sin. Thank you for the death of Jesus that has destroyed sin and death for us. Lord, I pray for all of those of us who have repented and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, that you would help us to continue to uncover our sin when we try to conceal it. Lord, as Pastor Mark just preached, whoever conceals his sins will not prosper but the one who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Thank you for that truth in Proverbs 28, 13. Would you help us to live like that's true because it is. Father, for anyone who's outside of the mercy of Christ, who is still concealing their sins, who is still living under that weight of shame and conviction without comfort, would you free them? Would you help them to cast themselves on you and your great compassion, your great mercy? Lord, you said that everyone who calls upon you will not be put to shame. Father, show us how to apply these truths to our, our lives and our marriages and our parenting and our work and everything this week. Lord, I pray that you'd nourish our bodies from the meal we're about to share. Would you prepare us to uh, take comfort and delight in studying your word together in Sunday school? 